you can all hear, I guess. You're nodding your heads. I guess that means yes. Uh, welcome back. It's nice to be back to somewhat normal with stuff. Um, as usual, I always introduce my lovely wife, Paulette. She's here today. Uh, and then we have cousins Penny and Bernie, which are finally back. They, they're the first time back for, what, nine months or something like that. Uh, first order of business. Uh, we have a new director down at the Monroe County History Center. Susan stepped down and uh, Daniel Slagle is the new director. And Daniel is here today, and he's gonna make a few, uh, Daniel's gonna make a couple of comments, I think. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you having me out here today. Um, I am the new Susan at the History Center, so we hope, we hope everyone stops by to see everything we have there. We do have several new exhibits up, so if you've not been out recently, please make sure to stop in and see those. We have um, See Her Run, about women in Monroe County and politics. Uh, Monroe County Cultures, so all the different cultures in Monroe County, there's an exhibit about that. And Dr. Bob Wren has a photo exhibit that's up that is, that is absolutely fantastic. If you know his photography, it is definitely worth coming out to see. And then next week, we'll have a new exhibit going up about textile accessories. So all the other stuff from our textile collection, there's a lot of neat stuff that our collections manager was telling me about. Um, other than that, should you find out there's anyone else that would like one of these RCA books, we do have those for sale in our store, so make sure to let them know. And there's a lot of other new items out there, so come by, stop by and see us. We're open Tuesday through Saturday, so have a great day. Thanks, Daniel. And uh, now, my Minister of Propaganda, if he had a microphone, can you all hear me? <laughs> yeah, we have to do this ballet with the microphone so that we don't ruin your hearing. <laughs> I'm George Carpenter. Uh, I'm one of, one of the co-founders of the History Club with, with Michael. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's because of Michael that I got associated with this. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, how many of you, is this for your first time to be here? Uh, okay. Uh, if you would like to be on our distribution list, and Daniel, you already are. I, Mike covered for you real quick. <laughs> uh, he said, be sure to get you on the list, so you're on the list. Uh, at any rate, if you'd like to be on our distribution list for email, uh, please uh, come up here and see my wife. She has a paper to put down your email address. I would personally like to apologize to Judy Enlow for having missed her email address last time, and her sister Linda will take that back to her. Right, Linda? That I apologize to everybody for having forgot that. I also want to recognize my wife, Mary, uh, for, for being here. Uh, we've been married for 50-some years, and she deserves some credit for that. <laughs> uh, Overall, the Legion. I grew up in this American Legion back when it was down on, on College Avenue. So this means a lot to me. My, my dad's picture is out there on the wall when you come in in one of the color guard uniforms. And my grandfather was one of the charter members of Post 18, and I'm really proud to be here. I'm also a lifetime member of this post. I'd like to thank Cats. You guys are great. It's time for you to do your presentation, Cats. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. The, the community doesn't know all the things that you offer, and we really want to be able to put that forward. And that's about all I have to say. Uh, turn it back over to Mike. Mr. Propaganda. Uh, <laughs> Actually, it's kind of cool. We, we got, we're scheduled up until March of next year now with some really talented people. Uh, for next month, August 31st, John Jake Butler will give a program called On the Way. It's a history of transportation in Monroe County. And he says he takes this up from starting with Indian trails to 
waterways, creeks, roads, highways, trains. And this, this guy is really good. He's given a couple of them before on different subjects, so uh, look forward to that. September 28th, Richard Koenig, uh, a fellow who was born here and raised here, but now lives in Michigan. He's going to drive all the way down from Michigan to give a, a program on these, these nice photos he took, mostly in the 70s and 80s, and mostly of the Monon Railroad. So uh, these are fascinating. Uh, October 26th, Derek Ritchie, a, a frequent contributor, good friend of mine, will be back to do a program on the Laberto Mansion and the Hunter Mansions, which were north of town. Roy's, it's 11th Street, right? Yeah. And they were famously torn down in the early 70s, I think. And he's telling the story of those mansions and the people who lived there. Uh, should be really great. November 30th, Jeremy Boshears will return. Uh, he gave one on covered bridges about three years ago. The covered bridges of Monroe County, and there were quite a few, but he's found out so much new material and so many new photos, he's got enough for another program. So he's going to come back and give that in November. December 28th, this is a little different, and we had this once before, but it was right before, uh, well, Cats TV couldn't make it because of the holiday, but uh, this is about four years ago. We had Chris do a program on the history of Cascades Golf Course. Now, you might think that would be boring, but it's not. And he's a history teacher himself, and it's just a marvelous program about Cascades. Uh, January 25th, James Capshew will return. He's given a couple for us. This will be on Herman B. Wells, the life of Herman B. Wells. He's a, kind of an expert on that. So, uh, February 22nd, which will be our ninth anniversary, uh, old classmate and old friend and frequent contributor Clay Stuckey is going to give a program on one of my one of the, the things I've wanted to program on forever is the history of Shower's Factory. So uh, Clay's are always great programs. March 29th, 2022, Hillary Fleck, who's over here, will give a uh, history of women in politics in Monroe County, going all the way back to the late 1800s, I think, or early 1900s. Early 1900s, something like that. Uh, so that brings us up to date. Uh, today, uh, this is another program on RCA, and uh, it's, it, we've got a good crowd again. That's fantastic. I hope people will ask a lot of questions and tell a few stories after Sandy's through speaking. And, of course, they already announced the, the books are for sale at $16.05, $16.05, I think, a copy. And they can take cash or card or I don't know what else, but uh, they got... Plenty of books here for people, I think. Uh, Sandy was in personnel at RCA, which is now called, famously, HR. So uh, back in those days, it's personnel. So rather than tell her story, I'll let her go into this. <laughs> I, almost picked your, I almost picked your program up. Don't so. do that. <laughs> no way. It's so good to see everybody here. Um, I'd like to see... Oh. I'd like to see how many of you actually worked at RCA, if you'd raise your hand. You are the he heroes and heroines of the meeting today. So glad to see you. I'd like to introduce you to the team helping me today. My husband, Jack Sheldon, who is doing the slides, hopefully in sync with what I'm saying. We practiced a few times, so which is good. And I'd like to have the History Center people who are going to be selling books, introduce themselves, if you'd stand up, please. I am Justin Robertson. I'm the office manager of the Monroe County History Center. I'm going to be selling um, the books that Sandy wrote on the RCA factory uh, over here. The, the inconvenient price of sixteen oh five. Taxes. Taxes. Um, if you only have $16, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> And Sandy has so generously donated the proceeds of the book to the History Center and the rights of the book. So thank you, Sandy. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Other History Center folks? He's representing all of us. Oh, is he? Okay. The yeah, spokesperson? The, collect the, <laughs> the collections manager, and we have Meg McDonald, the librarian. Great. Well, the history, the history Center is so wonderful. Um, I'd like to acknowledge three key people who made this book possible. 
into the mic. <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> um, key people who uh, made this book possible. The first is Gib Apple, and a number of you may know Gib. I call him Mr. RCA. Unfortunately, he has an illness that prevented him from coming today. Um, he really was the writer of this book. Um, while he was there and afterwards, he wrote a 35-page timeline of the book. And that became the basis for our story. He was so much fun to work with, and he has a great collection of memorabilia, and I will be showing you some of that in the program today. Um, ooh. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> um, his wife was also key in the process of creating the book. Sandy is her name, and uh, she has great memories of Gibbs' time at the plant. She also happens to have a great sense of humor. Um, she ended up being the editor of the book, which meant she had to read and reread and reread the book and get us straightened out and smooth out the narrative. And I really appreciate all she did. And the next uh, key person was Susan Dyer, then the director of the History Center. And when I went to Susan to propose possibly doing this book, we had a very nice talk. She was so enthusiastic, really gave us hope for actually getting this done. So um, after our conversation, I was leaving, and I turned to say to her, if we can finish this book, I will die happy. And she paused and said, you don't have to die. <laughs> so anyway, she was just a great helper. She's now in Florida spending time with her dad. I um, want to say a special welcome to her successor, Daniel Slagle. And I'm sure he'll run the ship just as well as she did. Um, also, maybe those of you who get the Herald Times, in April, uh, April 4th, Laura Lane did a article about RCA and the book. And um, when my husband handed me the paper that morning, he said, I think there's something in here. Well, it took up all the front page and all the back page. She did a wonderful job, included a lot of the photos that you will see today. So I, I want to tell you a little bit about me. Hopefully it won't bore you to tears. Um, I worked at RCA in personnel, as Michael said, from 1977 to 1983, which makes me a real short timer by RCA standards. Um, I remember while I was there, we celebrated the 50-year anniversary of a man named Whitey Payne. It was a big celebration, and he was actually allowed to retire, finally. So that was so impressive. Many, many employees at RCA worked 25, 30, 40 years or more. And this took a lot of strength, determination, and stick to -ativity. I had the pleasure to write a weekly newsletter, and I just met my predecessor here, which is just wonderful, the gal who did my job before me. Um, the newsletter was a lot of fun to do. Uh, we had recipes, word scramble puzzles, all kinds of things, and uh, that was a lot of fun. I also coordinated the activities association, which included uh, leagues like the bowling league, a camera club, the Ron and Gut Club, and many, many others. And um, at the beginning of each of the seasons of these leagues, they'd have a banquet, and then they'd have a banquet at the end. So I ended up eating a lot of fried chicken. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed my time at RCA. I then moved on to the Ford plant in Bedford, which some of you may be familiar with. And I, I was a little bit of a more of a long timer. I worked there 23 years. I also wrote a weekly employee newsletter. Um, and then prior to retirement, I worked at IU in their buildings and grounds department, guess what, doing an employee. This was a more of a magazine, a quarterly magazine, which I also enjoyed because it took me all over campus. And I have about 200 wonderful photos of the campus as a result. 
But RCA was the only place that I felt like writing about. It was so memorable, such an amazing place, marvelous people. And I dedicate this program to Gib and Sandy Apple, my book companions. An exhibit at the Monroe County History Center in 2018, the women of RCA was the inspiration for this book with vintage photos of the plant, examples of products, and a narrative history. This exhibit sparked my memories and my imagination. I wrote to Gib Apple, who was at that time sort of a famous retiree and a friend of all the retirees of the plant. And I said, there ought to be a book about the RCA plant. He responded, I've already started it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> And that's his 35-page timeline that he wrote. Just a marvelous document. The RSA plant might never have existed had it not been for two mysterious men who visited the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce in August of 1939. They wouldn't give their names or the company that they represented but they came to the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce with lots of questions. They said that, the, that Bloomington was a place of interest to their company. Well, two weeks later, they came back. They identified themselves and told the chamber that they represented the Radio Corporation of America and that they were looking for a place to put a radio production plant. <laughs> then they said, Forget that we were here. More than likely, nothing will happen. And they were also looking at places in Ohio and Illinois. Well, the Chamber of Commerce in Bloomington did not forget. And they put together a proposal to RCA for building the plant here. And that just made all the difference. We got the plant started. They um, acquired a building from the Showers Brothers Furniture Factory on Rogers Street. It was known as Plant 4, and um, it was empty, and it had dirt floors, so they had to do a little bit of renovation on that building. In 1940, 11 men from RCA in Camden, New Jersey, arrived to set up the Bloomington Works plant. The first employee hired was Mary Frances Roll, who many of you may remember. She was a dynamo. For years, she knew most of the employees by name, and she frequently visited the manufacturing floor. Mary Frances became a legend in her own time. She hired the first workers in the plant, and at that time, Southern Indiana was still in the depression, and I understand there was still food rationing at that time, with very few good paying jobs and a largely rural economy. Mary Frances stated, we had hundreds of applicants through the Employment Security Office. At first, RCA hired only single women. Between the ages of 18 and 28, with a high school degree, within weight and height limits, and of, quote, high moral character. I'm not sure how they measured that exactly, but <laughs> they also had to pass a physical and manual dexterity test. Gib Apple states that at that time, females were preferred as they were thought to be more receptive to repetitive assembly line work and their small hands were better suited for pickup and placement of small parts that went into making radios. Later, all these restrictions were lifted, thank heavens. Eventually, in the quest for more employees, Mary Frances went down to the coal country in southern Indiana that was really depressed, and she set up shop in schools and other public buildings to recruit workers to the plant. Eventually, private buses, which were old school buses painted red and white, conveyed employees from Bedford, Orleans, Paoli, and even Vincennes. 
She created the Activities Association with various teams and leagues based on the concept that employees who work together should also play together. If you see on this uh, aerial view of the original plant building, you can see a baseball diamond in back of the plant, and that I'm sure was part of the Activities Association. There was also a clubhouse where employees could meet and play. Employees took part in a bowling league, rod and gun club, softball league, horseshoe pitching, pitching league, and a camera club, and more. In the 1940s and 50s, the Activity Association also sponsored big dances with big name bands, including Louis Armstrong. Imagine that. Mary Frances later launched a program called Operation Pride, which, in which RCA volunteers help conduct an annual cleanup of the shores of Lake Monroe. Mary Frances was an ardent fisher person, and she noticed that there were all these fishing lines and other garbage around the lake. So this uh, later spread to the whole community. It was a community-wide event, and uh, we sure could use th that program now. The RCA Manufacturing Company, Inc., Wilmington Works Plant, began radio and 45 RPM record changer production in June 1940. Here you see a record changer. Isn't that cute? <laughs> um, and some models also showing off the record changer. But radios were the primary product at that time. And this is a, the Nipper radio, which was among the first produced. Years later, Gib Apple, my co-author, found this one in a barn sale for $5. Wages in the early 1940s, and I find this just incredible, were $7 to $7.80 per week. One million radios were produced in Bloomington by December of 1941. Nipper was the iconic dog listening to the phonograph. His master's voice was an 1899 painting by French painter Francis Barreau. The image was adopted by the RCA, or the, the Victor Talking Machine Company in 1900 as its logo. And there you see a, an early ad. The RCA works plant was described as well ventilated. There was no air conditioning, of course. And in this 1940s picture, you can see open windows at the top front of the building. Also a wonderful water tower there with RCA on it. Gib Apple remembers those days, and he said, my first assignment was supervisor of the printed circuit board assembly area. There were about 20 ladies placing very small components in circuit boards, and then the boards were floated across a large pot of very hot liquid solder. It was summertime, and there was no air conditioning. So on more than one occasion, I caught an employee who had passed out due to the heat and was falling off her stool. World War II began and in 1942, the Bloomington plant was chosen to produce a secret weapon for the Navy. The project was referred to in the plant as Madam X and involved secret rooms in which employees had to sign an oath never to discuss their work outside of that room. Well, it's no longer a secret. The product was called the VT, or Proximity Fuse. This fuse would electronically detonate a projectile's payload when it was in proximity and range of the target. In 1945, the Navy awarded the plant with a special three-star flag for its efforts to support the country at time of war. By the end of World War II, Men returning to civilian life were recruited to the Bloomington plant. 
but women were the majority of workers for the plant's entire history. In the late 1940s, the plant produced console and table radios. I love the group pictures of the women. They're just great. And you can tell who the supervisors are. They're wearing ties. In 1944, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, IBEW 1424, was chartered to represent the RCA employees. In the case of the Bloomington plant, it could have been called the Sisterhood of Electrical Workers. This is one of my favorite pictures of all, a woman with a RCA patch on her arm and that wonderful lacy a apron. She could have been making cookies instead of parts of radios, but just a great photo. <clears throat> Work at RCA plant was hard, very hard. Some workers had to perform 16 operations while products moved along the assembly lines. Jobs put strains on workers, but were later improved by better engineering of the jobs. A new era began during 1948 Monroe County history, history, Monroe County Fair, when RCA set up a demonstration of a television set. A camera and receiver were set up, and hundreds of people at the fair went through to see themselves on television. Gibbs states, the new miracle of television was launched in Bloomington. Black and white TV production began in 1949. The first TVs had 12 and a half inch screens, and they, as you can see, they're sort of rounded out. The plant re recruited hundreds more employees to keep up with the demand for black and white TVs. An engineer from RCA, Sarkis Tarzan, created the first television broadcasting station in Indiana, WTTV, here in Bloomington. He went on to build a factory in Bloomington to produce essential parts for RCA TVs. He was pretty smart. As broadcasting facilities expanded around the country, black and white television sets became a hot commodity. Oh, yes. <laughs> Some of you may remember this test pattern uh, that appeared when no programs were being broadcast. And my companion at the table said his daughter would come down the stairs and watch this signal pattern. <laughs> Moving on to the 1950s, the plant celebrated its 10th anniversary in June 1950. And if you can uh, look closely at this, you'll see sort of the parade of products from the plant and the years that they were produced. It's a great magazine cover. This is a truck from the 1950s, and on the side it says, radios, television, phonographs, radio tubes, Victor and Bluebird records, sound motion picture, and electronic equipment. And then, of course, it says RCA and has nipper on it. RCA Victor Division. Radio Corporation of America. That's certainly a piece of history. In January 1954, RCA Corporation demonstrated its first 15-inch color TV featuring the Rose Bowl Parade broadcast from California to Radio City in New York. Initial color TV pro production in 1954 was pretty small, about 4,300 color TV sets. The plant added a 175,000 square foot warehouse and distribution center up the hill from the original plant one. It was named Apple Hill in honor of the orchard that it replaced. My co-author Gib Apple hurries to say it was not named after him. <laughs> In 1957, there were 3,000 employees in the Bloomington plant. In the late 1950s, the Bloomington plant produced TVs not only for RCA, but also for Magnavox, Zenith, Motorola, and others. Yes. 
Oh, I have to come on down this picture. You see the guy in the plaid pants, and he has a mallet raised above his head. This guy had no frustrations. He whacked the TVs, and it was called the flash when tapped test. <laughs> I love that. <clears throat> Okay, in 1965, a new plant built, oh, yes, I should comment on this. Gib Apple is actually the fellow on the right, and he's uh, there with George Lascaris, manager of quality, and Bob Veit, a manufacturing manager, admiring one of the great RCA Hunsell TVs. <coughs> In 1965, a new plant building, Plant 2, was added, bringing total production space to 1,420,000 square feet. It was a big place. Plant 2 contained the final assembly of televisions, and Plant 1 pr produced the inside of the TV, the printed circuit boards, and chassis. Plant One products traveled to Plant Two via an overhead monorail or tunnel in which the TV chassis were hung on hooks and transferred over to the Plant Two. Here are some pictures of final assembly in Plant Two. There we go. Um, the insertion, there's the aerial of Plant Two. Uh, this is the insertion of the picture tube, which was held by a vacuum uh, device. And here uh, is the guy with the mallet. And uh, putting the chassis in and then wiring it, there was a lot of wiring involved. In 1966, and this is also incredible, I think, they had a peak of 8,000 employees. I'm not really sure where they put them all. I'm sure it was a three-shift operation but still amazing number. Birming Bloomington was proclaimed color television capital of the world. In 1967, color TV sales exceeded $3 billion. All was not sweetness and light between the IBEW Local 1424 and the RCA plant. In 1950, there were brief, was a brief walkout strike about wages and benefits. There were three strikes between 1964 and 1968, primarily about the company violating rules of the contract, including work speed-ups and manipulating worker classifications. Over the years, the union settled grievances and with each new contract gained pay increases for the plant employees. Between 1966 and 1970, competition from Japanese and electronic industries grew from 12% to 37% of the market. At that time, the Color T Track TV was launched, and it was built from the 1970s to the 1990s, so it was a long-term uh, product of the plant. In 1970, the 30 millionth color TV came off the line in Bloomington. The color, sorry, color track TVs were heavily marketed, and here you see an ad. At that point, the musical Annie was very popular, so you see Annie there, and of course, Nipper. And we have another uh, ad for color track TVs the best color TV you can buy? Yes, they said yes, absolutely. However, in 1973, RCA opened a plant in Juarez, Mexico. This was the handwriting on the wall. Between 1975 and 1982, 3,500 jobs in the Bloomington plant were lost. All chassis manufacturing moved to Juarez. In the meantime, the Bloomington plant added automated equipment and new manufacturing technologies to improve efficiency. Offshore competitors were putting added pressure on RCA and the plant. By 1980, 
a major number of components were being built in Juarez and Torreon, Mexico, and also in Taiwan, China. Plant one was empty. In 1980, a new product, the video disc player, was introduced to the Bloomington plant. This was to be an alternative to the not very technical uh, VCRs that were available then and that they were very expensive. The discs were the size of records. And so two assembly lines helped fill plant one and 200 new employees were added. It's a picture of the player. But VCRs could both record and play shows and soon became a huge consumer product. And in 1983, Prices dropped on VCRs, so guess what? Video discs became a relic, and production was halted in 1984. Plant one was empty again. In December of 1985, employees were devastated to learn that RCA had been sold to General Electric. Up till then, GE was an unsuccessful competitor of RCA. Only two years later, GE sold consumer electronics to Thomson Electronics, a French company. The televisions in the Bloomington plant would retain the RCA brand name, and you can still find RCA TVs on the market. Some TVs were made for General Electric at that time. In 1990, RCA employee Brenda Hall told a story about a devastating tornado that hit Bedford and destroyed her home. Fortunately, she was away from home at the time. Her 13-inch RCA TV was the only survivor sitting in her yard, intact except for a few nicks on the cabinet. It needed a new extension cord, and the remote didn't work. But when she turned it on, lo and behold, it worked. So she said, I got a chance to see the quality of products we build. That's what I call quality. In October of 1990, the plant had 1,635 employees with an average age of 47. I told you they stuck around for a long time and with 24 years of service. Upon retirement, employees were presented with a console TV. In 1990, the Bloomington plant produced its 50 millionth color TV. A big celebration was held, including food, music, and even skydivers. The plant was closed for the afternoon, so employees could watch Bobby Knight and his team practice in the assembly hall. At that time, a time capsule was buried in what is now the RCA Community Park south of town to be opened in 2015. Here, Judy Guntherman, there she is, retrieves items from the time capsule in RCA Community Park. The early 1990s presented huge challenges for the US manufacturing community. Slow TV sales and international competition bore down on the Bloomington plant. In 1991, large screen TVs hit the market. So the Bloomington plant made TVs with screens sizes from 20 inches to 52 inches. They were projection TVs. In 1994, RCA and IBW held dis discussions about reducing labor costs. Meanwhile, in 1995, the 65 millionth color TV was produced. By 1996, Thompson Consumer Electronics Division was $2,002 million in the red. The company could not sustain such losses. In 1997, the company announced that the Bloomington plant would be closed on April 1st, 1998. At that time, there were 1,200 employees, and they earned, earned an average of $14 per hour, little improvement on the start of the plan. In 2000, 
In tribute to the employees of the Bloomington plant, Gib Apple stated, the dedication of employees of the plant did not change as the company transitioned from RCA to GE to Thompson and then to Closure. They continued to produce a well-known product with high quality standards until the last set on the last day. A 58 year era had passed. Over those years, the Bloomington RCA plant made a huge impact on thousands of Hoosiers and on the Southern Indiana economy. It is still alive in our memory, a remarkable place because of its remarkable people. We salute our absent and present RCA friends and their families. Our book is dedicated to the women and men of the RCA plant. So we don't end on a sad note. I'd like to share some of Gib Apple's RCA memorabilia. This is a sweet little music box. Nipper and the phonograph rotate on the top. And the tune is, oh, where, oh, where has my little dog gone? <laughs> It's, and it plays to this day. Here's an RCA toboggan hat and a cap uh, from the Indy 500. In 1991, RCA sponsored a race car. Here's a transistor radio, which I don't believe was made in the RCA plant, but I don't know for sure. It's very cute. And the record changer, which uh, was in the exhibit at the History Center. Gibb is a great golfer. So you see here um, on the middle right shelf, RCA golf balls. And here's a seat cushion from RCA Dome. Maybe you remember that. And a little nipper with a scarf on it for winter. These license plates were given to anyone who put in an employee suggestion at one point. And I remember years la later, I would see those license plates on the front of cars. It was a popular item. This is probably my favorite piece of Gibbs collection. It's a little light blue alligator case, and inside is a record changer and a demonstration record of old McDonald's farm, which it still plays and it sounds great. So here's the 45. Does anyone here remember 45 records? Um, they've become collectors. I am. And this is from the inside lid of that uh, wonderful record player, Victrola. Here's my great friend, Gib Apple, with the largest nipper that we've ever found. And this resided in the plant manager's office for many decades. At one point, we used it to produce a, a float in the Bloomington July 4th parade. And here's my commercial. <laughs> um, Gib and I, looking at the book, we were so happy when it came off the press. Now, I. I think this will be the best part of this presentation, which is your comments on, and stories on the RCA plant. Maybe some of you had relatives that worked there. Um, I know some of you actually worked there. Just about everyone in Bloomington has some little memory of the RCA plant. So we welcome you to share those. And Michael is going to go around with a microphone so that everyone can hear you. So if you just Introduce yourself and what your connection is to the plant, and we welcome any and all stories. Thanks. How about that? 
and uh, she worked on the proximity fuse in the secret room. Uh, not for all that long, she got tired of it <laughs> and wanted to quit. She remembers telling the, I don't know whether it was a plant foreman or her boss, she wanted to quit. And he said, you can't quit. You, you signed a uh, document that said you were supposed to go through the duration. Well, so she worked there a little while longer, and then she thought, well, maybe she could go to Crane. They actually were working on the same thing, Crane, so he said, well, that's okay, I guess. So I don't know why she wanted to go to Crane. Maybe they paid more, but she ended up at Crane. So uh, that was her story. Uh, the proximity fuse, which helped to win the war, I understand. Also, I heard somebody said on uh, Facebook that seemed to know what they were talking about, that Crystal Gale worked at RCA like in the early 1970s or something. Uh, her boyfriend or her husband was going to school at IU. Has anybody else heard that? Somebody said she still owns land down there. So I don't know. I, I'd never heard that before. What? Oh. Who had their hand up? Oh. oh. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Is Ramona? Hi. Uh, my name is Ramona Pound, and my uncle, um, Alvin Trisler, was, who is also known as Doc, um, was recruited by RCA because he was apparently a very good baseball player. And RCA had a baseball team that was a traveling baseball team. And so a lot of the time he said, they had great trips, and he was doing that and getting paid to play baseball. Um, another story that he told was <clears throat> when he went to work at RCA, they, I guess, maybe gave him some options of what he could do, and he said, well, the only thing that he really knew how to do was maintenance. So he was going to be a maintenance man. So he went home, and he told um, his wife, my Aunt Bonnie, um, that he was going to do maintenance at RCA, and she said, well, don't let them make you do anything dangerous. The next day, or the day after that, there was um, a picture and story um, in the newspaper, and it showed him painting the RCA water tower. <laughs> I wouldn't have done that, that's for sure. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. ah. <clears throat> My name is Devon Sims. Uh, quick story, I uh, high school in 52. I was 17 years old, thought I wanted to go to IU, but I lasted three weeks. <laughs> Wasn't ready, okay? So I thought, well, I'll go to RCA. Well, I was putting back covers on the back of TV. I lasted three nights. So I said, well, I better uh, try to do something. So I joined the Air Force, uh, came home, came back, put an application in. They said, no, I'm sorry, you quit without notice. They wouldn't hurt me. Okay. So I went to school, <clears throat> come back. My friends worked here. So we ended up at RCA in 1963, uh, retiring in 96. Good career. Good place to work. Got some other folks? I, we lived on what, 2nd Street, and I can remember when the shifts changed at RCA. 2nd Street would go from a not too busy street to crazy busy real quickly, about 4 o'clock. Is that, is that what it was? Something like that. My mom worked at RCA, and she's a plant nurse. Uh, with, uh, I remember her plant, her manager's name was Fred. Yes, and uh, she worked in the personnel division with Mary Frances Roll. Mary Frances Roll was uh, the aunt to one of our classmates, Mike Roll, uh, from uh, we went through grade school and high, uh, in high school with Mike. Uh, that was yeah, my mom really liked working at RCA, uh, and she re recalled a lot of the incidents that you were talking about with the people working on the lines with the hot solder pots running and she'd be called out with a wheelchair to take somebody into the cool air conditioned portion of the dispensary where she worked. Yeah, it, was a, it was a tough time. Any, 
anywhere now would have been air conditioned. And uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, where'd you go, Mike? Thank you. But when did they get air conditioning? Oh, okay. <laughs> Kelly. Really? Oh, yeah. I think when my friend Kelly Brannigan worked there, they didn't have air conditioning, did they? Kelly, or did they? Come in while, yeah, it come in while we were there. And uh, I went down there to work. I worked at, I come in when the, the height of the, when they had the 7,000 people working there. And I worked in receiving, which was an upgraded good job. Uh, then they kicked everything back, and I got sent back to plant two, and it then the, the tube job, which is the most horrible job in the whole plant. So that's where you lifted a 45-pound picture tube up with one hand, and done operation on it, set it down with your left hand back in the TV times 1,100 times a day. So it was like working out all day long for, I think, what was we making? It wasn't much. But... <laughs> But anyway, while I was doing that job, I met my wife, the one I'm married to now for 51 years. So something did good come out. But shortly after that, I quit and went to work someplace else. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. You say there was somebody else? Gene Oldman, I have two connections to RCA. My mom was working there whenever she met my father, and I was the cause of her to be able to quit RCA. She became a housewife and mother to me and my brothers, and she went back to RCA, one of her first Thompsons, and until they finally des decided to close the building down. And Mike, it was in the 1960s that they got air conditioning in plant one. My dad worked over at Griff Motor Express across the Roger Street and the, across the train tracks, and it, he was working night shift, and I'm not sure what year it was, I've asked a couple of other of these programs, nobody can remember the exact year, but he told me that he was watching construction cranes lift the uh, air conditioning units off the ground and up on top of plant one to be installed for the air conditioning units. But both of them have passed, and so I've lost all chances of asking what year that was, so. Thank you, Gene. That's great. Have somebody over here? I feel like one of those game show hosts, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, well, Mike told one of my stories already. Um, I, I grew up on, uh, at 700 block of uh, West Wiley. So when at shift, or you know, when four o'clock when day shift got off, um, people would go down Wiley Street to hit um, second to go out to Bloomfield and parts west. And uh, it, at our house, if you wanted to run an errand in the afternoon, you made sure that you went before 4, or you couldn't go till 4.30. So, I mean, you just couldn't get out of our driveway. So that was one thing. Then, um, when I was um, fresh out of IU journalism school in 1971, uh, my first job was at RCA and was actually doing what Sandy did um, in personnel, uh, doing their newsletter and uh, magazine. And um, that was a wonderful job for um, for me, because I learned a lot of stuff about producing publications and um, how to deal with people and that kind of thing. But the best, um, the best thing I learned during that time um, and that I've always carried with me is that everybody has a story. Everybody in that plant had a story to tell. And I tried to t get as many of them in the, in the magazine as I could, but... Um, and I looked back at my magazines lately, and I thought, my goodness, I really wrote a lot, a lot of stuff. But um, I'll tell you what, there, from the guy that that produced or um, took care of guinea pigs and sold guinea pigs and that kind of thing to, um, I don't know, the the guy in Miller at Miller Drive who headed up the neighborhood association. There were just so many stories. Everybody had a story, and and to realize that as a journalist, you know, you. Um, you carry that with you, and you know that you're always going to have somebody who has a story to tell. Thanks, Kathy. Anybody else have anything to contribute? All right. Is there another one? Oh, okay. Way over here. Huh? <laughs> Who 
Who is it? Oh, Kathy. <laughs> I, I'm Ethel. I worked at RCA, I mean, yes, RCA when I was 16. So I think I was the youngest person there. And I worked till the very last day. And I cried when I had to leave. I met my husband there, and it was a nice place to work. Okay, anyone else? Okay. That's closer anyway. I'm Bob Hannum. Uh, I went to work uh, out of high school. Uh, I was looking for a job, and my dad told me, he said uh, he knew Mary Frances. He says, call her. So I did, and she says, you come down here tomorrow. And I went to work the next day. <clears throat> but the thing I remember about my job there I worked for about a year and a half before I went to school, and I was downstairs uh, as a stock handler near the end of the line, and at uh, the final uh, quality control, they put the uh, test pattern on the screen and made sure that was perfect. <clears throat> and then they tested the sound. And I heard roll out the barrel for 365 days a year. <laughs> and that wasn't the real reason I quit, but it was part of it. I, I ended up after school working for RCA in Indianapolis for 32 years. So you know all the words to roll out the barrel, so. Okay. Anyone else? Any other comments? Well, thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>